First, many of you are familiar with the work of Milton Erickson, but some are not, in my opinion, and, and many other psychotherapists, I'm sure, uh, he is one of the most creative, or was one of the one of the most creative, intuitive therapists of our time, a true genius in the recognition and use of subtlety in psychotherapy. And Jeffrey has spent much of his life representing, learning, extending, and promoting the work of Milton Erickson through the Milton Erickson Foundation. Jeffrey is a clinical psychologist in Phoenix, Arizona, engaged in private practice. He's been there for more than 20 years. He's the president of Zyg, Tucker, and Company Publishers. He has more than six years of intermittent study with Milton Erickson. He conducts workshops on Ericksonian techniques in more than 35 countries. He's the founder, director, and president of the board of directors for the Milton Erickson Foundation. And he's the organizer of seven international congresses on Ericksonian approaches to hypnosis and psychotherapy. He's the organizer of the Brief Therapy Conference and the organizer of the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conferences, um, which are held around the world. And there's, as you can see, an overhead of the next Brief Therapy Conference. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Zeig. Well, thank you so much. It's really an honor and a great pleasure to be here. And this is my second opportunity to present a, a keynote presentation at the Meaning Conference. So uh, I'm just completely... That have been, and wise words, that have been presented to you. And so I'd like to shift the focus a little bit and not be the purveyor of wise words, but be more the elicitor of some wise experiences. And this fits very much with the model of hypnosis. In traditional hypnosis, tr hypnosis prior to Erickson, the direction of the hypnosis was this way. Hypnosis was traditionally seen as an outside-in approach where a hypnotist would project ideas into a relatively passive patient. Well, Erickson's model, as elaborated by Ernest Rossi, focused not on the word induction, but it focused on the word elicitation. How could hypnosis be done this way, where the purpose of the hypnosis was to bring forward previously unrecognized learnings, where the presupposition was that the patient had within a wealth of ideas, experiences, memories, and that the job of the psychotherapist was to create a psychotherapy that was the reassociation of internal life. The idea would be that every phobic patient had a wealth of experience at relaxing, every smoker had a wealth of experience at being comfortable without a cigarette, every schizophrenic would have a wealth of experience at communicating correctly, and the job of the psychotherapist was to stimulate into play, and I mean that literally, stimulate into play some of the resources that have been habitually dormant. Okay, so that's all well and good. And we can think about hypnosis and perhaps changing the direction of hypnosis and thinking that hypnosis is something that we could perhaps add to our psychotherapy, whether we're doing psychoanalysis or family therapy, there are techniques that we could take from hypnosis and apply them in our psychotherapy. Hypnosis could be considered a model of influence communication. When I was with Erickson, it was a remarkable experience to be with him because Erickson took the words and he focused those words so that each one of his words was surgical. And he took the implication of the words. And the implication of those words, the implication was surgical. It was directed. It was focused. And his gestures were surgical. The purpose of his gestures had an intent. And the implication of the gestures was surgical. And the effect of that was that I never felt so loved 
as when I was with Milton Erickson. Because here was somebody who was working so hard to focus every nuance, every word, to have an effect on me. Okay, again, that's interesting. But let's think a little bit differently. Let's say that if we search around and we look to the philosophical universe, that suddenly we pick up some lenses and we can use these lenses to examine different phenomena. And we could use a, a lens, for example, of constructivism to examine uh, how to create vision in, in a uh, frog's eye, like Maturana did. But could we think for a moment, strangely, that perhaps hypnosis is not a tool that could be used to suggest or that could be used to elicit, but could we think that hypnosis was a lens? And hypnosis could be not even considered a technique of psychotherapy, but a lens through which we could examine the philosophical universe. And that's a strange idea, but I'm going to offer that idea to you and going to try to elaborate on that idea and see how that can be relevant to our understanding of concepts such as freedom, justice, and responsibility and how it can be applicable to the job of doing psychotherapy and even more the job of being a psychotherapist. Okay, now... Let's say that you uh, wake up tomorrow morning, and when you wake up tomorrow morning, you say it's a beautiful day, probably not in Vancouver for, for many of you, but it's a beautiful day wherever it is that you grow up, <laughs> wherever it is that you're living. <laughs> Thank you, Freud. <laughs> wherever it is that you're living, you say it's a beautiful day, you say, oh, I think that I will be a patient in psychotherapy. If you say to yourself tomorrow, I think that I'll be a patient in psychotherapy, how would you accomplish that? Well, you could accomplish being a patient in psychotherapy by doing this and by saying something inside your head or socially. And what you would have to say is one or a combination of eight things. If you said, for example, can't, um, uh, always, never, yes but, I should, if only, what if, and if he, she, they would just, then you can earn the right to pay someone $100, $150 an hour, to talk to about your problems. If you say, I can't, like I can't have good relationships, if you say, I always, like I always get to places late, like you say, I never, and like uh, I uh, never uh, speak comfortably in front of people. If you say, yes, I understand, but I can't really change, if you say, I should, like I should read journals every day and study more about my particular field. If you say, if only, I have made good choices. If you say, what if, like what if the airplane falls out of the sky. And if you say, if he, she, they would just be more sensible or more sensitive, then you could earn the right to be a patient in psychotherapy. Take the posture which is a posture of limitation, a posture of tension. You'd have to be into that state of tension, limitation, where you weren't seeing very much, and where you weren't accessing any of the complementary resources that you would have in your life. You would have to dissociate yourself from the resources that you have. Every person who has a phobia knows how to relax. But they don't get the idea of being able to take their 
history of relaxation and bring it into the situation that they need. Every depressed person knows how to change their mood. They know how to cheer up. But when they're into that state, they feel as if they're dissociated from those resources and they can't connect themselves with those resources that they have. So that we can consider, more or less, the state of being a patient. You would get into this limited posture. You would have a little vocabulary that you would be saying inside your head. You would have a vocabulary that you would be saying socially. And you'd have a role. The role would be that you were a victim, perhaps a hapless victim. You would be a victim of your attitudes, a victim of your behavior, a victim of your past, a victim of your present projections about the future, a victim of your social circumstances. You would communicate in some way that you were a victim. Then you would be a patient in psychotherapy. Okay? Now, second problem. Now that we understand a little bit about how to be a patient in psychotherapy, our next question could be, how do you do psychotherapy? Now the question, how do you do psychotherapy, has been uh, examined by many different people. I did one book that I edited with a co-author, uh, Michael Munyon, called What is Psychotherapy? In which we asked 80 experts, transpersonal, uh, family therapy, psychodrama, um, uh, physical, uh, bio, physical therapies, body therapies, psychoanalysts. We asked them, what is essentially psychotherapy? And when we asked these 80 experts to come up with a capsule definition of how do you do psychotherapy, what is psychotherapy, we couldn't get agreement. It was hard to take that data and generalize it to have a generic definition of psychotherapy because the experts couldn't agree on what was the essential unit of analysis. They couldn't agree that the essential unit of analysis was behavior or affect or relationship or attitude. Imagine trying to have a science like physics, and you can't have a science like physics without being able to agree on what the essential elements of the field are. You have to say electrons or quarks are essential, and then you can build a science based on what is the essential unit. Well, 80 experts in psychotherapy couldn't agree on what is the essential unit of psychotherapy. But when it comes to the practice, how do you do psychotherapy, what do psychotherapists do? Well, I think that what psychotherapists do is they do this. What psychotherapists do is they enter into the Joyce Brothers posture. And they uh, speak in very soft voices. And they use a particular grammar. Usually something like, well, can you tell me more? How do you feel about that? And essentially, what psychotherapists do is that they ask patients to introspect. And they ask patients to introspect in accord with a particular theory of psychotherapy, a particular theory of personality, a particular theory of human development that they have. But still, the frame of psychotherapy is a frame of introspect. The therapist communicates to the patient introspect. And uh, again, according to the dictates of a particular theory, uh, I'll give you a little graphic that I, I use to illustrate this. And it's a, a not really a, a handout, it's more of an aesthetic graphic where. Uh, I was looking at some of the different perspectives that psychotherapists take. If the psychotherapist takes a perspective, an introspective perspective of etiology, the goal of therapy changes. If the therapist takes a perspective of 
bring forward the underlying psychodynamics, the goal of psychotherapy changes. If the therapist takes a perspective of body work, the goal of psychotherapy changes. If the therapist takes a perspective of biology, the goal of psychotherapy changes. But still, for the most part, perhaps uh, not with body work or perhaps not with biology, the essential frame of the therapist to patient is introspect. Think about the roles, think about the rules, think about the attitudes, think about the cognitions that you have, think about the feelings that you have. So if the patient comes in and the patient says, you know, I'm anxious, and the therapist is Rogerian and the therapist says, seems like you're feeling tense. The therapist is still asking the patient to introspect about their affect. Well, I think that if we take this idea that oops, there on the floor of the philosophical universe is a tool called hypnosis. And if we looked at hypnosis as a lens for examining psychotherapy, we would find that hypnosis for the most part, especially in the way in which Erickson has conceived it, is not done with the imperative of introspect. So here's an offer. An offer is that uh, right now, with your kind permission, any of, the, any of you that want to participate, I will uh, offer you a uh, brief uh, induction of hypnosis. Is that okay? I, I think that, you know, it's the only intelligent thing to do after lunch. <laughs> you bypass the postprandial crash. Okay, so now to enter into hypnosis, one thing that you could do is put aside any notes that you have. And uh, then you could establish yourself in a kind of balanced posture. And that balanced posture would be a posture in which you could place your hands effortlessly on your legs in such a way that your thumbs are not touching. And that would allow your arms to maintain themselves effortlessly against your sides so that you could begin to feel yourself comfortably contained by your arms against your side. And that would allow you to realize effortlessly the way in which there's a certain sense of balance that you may not have been, been aware of before, that you may feel the balance of comfort, of your head resting effortlessly, supported by the muscles of your neck. And that will allow you to attend with your ears to some of my words effortlessly. And then you may realize that you can just take an easy breath. And you may recognize that you can take another easy breath so that you can comfortably just close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, it can be so pleasant to just allow yourself to go inside. Realizing that as you go inside, you may pay special attention to the sound of my voice. And as you pay special attention to the sound of my voice, 
you may notice changes in the tone. And as you listen carefully and effortlessly, perhaps you may notice the sound of your own breathing. And as you begin to really attend inside, you can notice the sound changes as your body continues to effortlessly accommodate itself to the resting state. And all along, you could quite comfortably and confidently just look behind your eyes, realizing that as you look behind your eyes, you may be delighted to notice that there are patterns Perhaps you may recognize that there are patterns of color. You may realize that there are patterns that have shape. You may notice the way in which the patterns may move. And effortlessly you can be fascinated with the changing patterns now as your body continues to accommodate itself to the resting state and you can be aware of the way in which your feet can balance on the floor and you may notice the way in which you can effortlessly sink into the comfort of the seat rest. How you may attend to the back rest and the way in which you can just effortlessly allow yourself to sink back into the support backrest, and you can be aware of the presence, of the absence of arm rest, head rest, realizing how easily and comfortably you can just find yourself moving forward a little bit into the developing sensations of going inside and enjoying the way in which you can change the focus of your comfort, of your attention so easily. Recognizing that as I've been talking with you, certain changes, changes occur as your body can accommodate itself to the resting state. You may notice that your breathing rhythm has slowed down. You may notice how the pulse of your experience is different. You may notice that there are interesting fluttery feelings. around your eyelids. You may notice that there are ways in which you're swallowing. You're not swallowing things wholly in the same way as you were before. And all along, all along it may seem to you somehow as if you're just an intelligence, as if you're just an intellect, a vast intelligence just floating in space, just flowing in time. 
and time and space can seem so terribly unimportant, now the really important thing is you. Developing comfort. And you may want to recognize how you can effortlessly memorize some of those experiences of comfort. Because they're feelings that you may want to keep. Feelings that you may want to bring forward any time you wish. So that for a moment you may imagine yourself comfortably at home with those effortless feelings. You may imagine yourself for a moment in relationship to the capacity of your inner mind to guide you with those effortless feelings. You may imagine those effortless feelings at work inside you. And all along you may notice how you can just think back comfortably remembering some of those feelings and so that you can look forward effortlessly to bringing those feelings with you so many different ways and times in your future. And so here, now, now, here, I'd like you to begin to reorient yourself. And I'd like you to understand that you can reorient yourself fully and easily, easily and comfortably, comfortably and completely. Reorient yourself now taking one or two or three easy breaths. Please just take one or two or three easy breaths and then stretch. Open your eyes and bring yourself back completely rested, refreshed and energetic, wide awake, all, all over. Hi. Pleasant enough? Okay. Now, let's think about that for a moment not as being a trance in the traditional sense, but think that what I did was that I offered you an opportunity to have an experience of changing your state. And that somehow we as psychotherapists can do things like learn hypnosis, and by virtue of learning hypnosis, we can help people to shift their state. And for those of you who went along with the experience, you shifted your state. Now that as a model in psychotherapy has been given limited applicability because it's only been applied to hypnosis. But if we think about the patient coming into our office, thinking can't always never, if only, yes, but what if, if he should, the, they would just, etc., etc. The patient coming in is in a state. And what we may think of as a, one of our roles as a psychotherapist is that we can help people to shift states. If we can help people to shift states into hypnosis, we can help people to shift their state in other ways. Okay, so... Let's... Uh, just think for a moment about hypnosis. When I wanted to do hypnosis, what I would do is to offer you an induction. And when I was offering you an induction, there was a little scheme that I have in mind of trying to help you to develop a phenomenology. And uh, the purpose of my induction was to offer you an opportunity to shift your phenomenology in four different ways. I know that when I'm doing hypnosis, if I help you to guide your attention, 
if I help you to alter the intensity of your experience, more or less vivid, if I help you to experience some sense of dissociation, being part and a part of the experience, being here but not here, and if I offer you an, I, an opportunity to change your response so that you're responding more to the innuendo of communication, then you experience hypnosis. So the way that I created that induction was that I thought of a sub-phenomenology. Hypnosis is a trance, it's a phenomenology, but that phenomenology is made, made up of a number of component parts. As I was doing the induction, I was thinking about the component parts. I put those component parts into a, on a stage. If you wanted to play with those component parts, you could play with those component parts. Therefore, you would create a, a trance by virtue of, re, of building up a phenomenology. Okay, now let's think about the patient. Let's take a particular patient here. Let's take the patient uh, who is, uh, oops, <laughs> patients don't do happiness. Let's take the patient who is doing, oh, I think I got my hand out of order here. Here, doing depression. Let's say that depression is not a physiological entity that exists inside. Let's say that depression is a state. And if depression is a state, what are the component parts of being depressed? Well, if you wake up tomorrow morning in your home and you go inside yourself, you become inactive, you start feeling hopeless, you don't orient towards goals, you live your life in an unchangeable past, bring the unchangeable past into the present. If you are negative in general, if you are intrapunitive, negative about yourself, if you are withdrawn, and if you are totally absorbed in your sensations, then you do depression. You could build up the state by doing this sub-phenomenology. And then if you did this sub-phenomenology, suddenly you would find yourself in the state of being depressed. If you got the idea that you would do happiness, well, you could do happiness by doing a different sub-phenomenology. If you were more external, more active, if you ac accessed hope, if you oriented towards goals, lived in the present, if you were positive, balanced about blame, neither blaming yourself too hard nor blaming others too hard, if you were engaged with people, moving towards rather than withdrawing, and if you were using your eyes rather than your body, you would do happiness. Now, curiously, if you think about that in the next table, take this. I uh, put them side by side. If you wanted to do depression, you could do those things. If you wanted to do happiness, as it turns out, you would do the opposite of depression. Because if you just took the things that somebody was doing to do depression and you reversed them, you get happiness. The phenomenology of happiness is opposite. So suddenly we would have goals for psychotherapy. And this would be a little bit systemic when you began to think about it because you wouldn't have to change all of these things. You wouldn't have to access all of these things. If you wanted to help somebody shift a state, if you just changed what the minimal systemic aspects, what are the minimal systemic changes that will change the system, what are the minimal systemic activities that will create a new phenomenology, then you are doing systemic therapy, but not working with a social systemic therapy, with an internal systemic therapy. And we would have a bridge. And the bridge would be hypnosis. 
Hypnosis would be saying to the patient, well, if I can do something that help you change your state once, move into a state of hypnosis, then I can do something to help you change your state twice, move into a state of happiness. So it would be a little bit in a metaphor like driving a car. Your car is in reverse, the state of the patient. You move into hypnosis. Well, you change the state once. You're in a state of neutral. And then you can change your state twice, move into first gear, and then you are moving into a more effective state. Okay. That is the essential of this state model. So then I started thinking about the problem that we have here, which is to understand freedom and to understand responsibility and to understand justice. And if we think about freedom and we think about uh, justice and we think about responsibility, we could think about those as things. But because I'm a hypnotist, I can say, well, let's think about those as being states. Let's think about justice as being a state. Let's think about freedom as being a state. Let's think about responsibility as being a state. Let's take a tool from the floor of the philosophical universe and apply that to the concepts that we have at hand. So this is where I started in my presentation. I took the liberty of redefining some of the terms in particular ways. I said, okay, well, there's personal freedom. What's the phenomenology of personal freedom? The phenomenology of personal freedom is that you'd have an orientation, liberty. You would have a little vocabulary, I want, because that would be part of freedom. You would have uh, a, uh, another aspect of that vocabulary, I can just, and that would be part of freedom. And you could build up freedom as a state by going, oh yeah, I want, oh yeah, I just taking an orientation of liberty and taking a posture of, if you take this posture, you may begin to generate freedom in, in, an, in and of itself. And then I thought, okay, well, what about personal responsibility? And personal responsibility, if you wanted to generate a state of personal responsibility, the feeling that would be attached to that, maybe the feeling would be guilt because you would be looking inside yourself and you would be wondering what was right. And then you would have a vocabulary that, you would be going along, that would be going along with it. Well, I should. What should I do? You'd be looking inside, searching inside, I should. And you would have a posture that would be more internal, more, more tense, more thinking inside yourself, trying to look for experience and rules about what responsibility would be. If you are interested in justice, social justice, and again, I'm loosely defining these terms, if you are interested in social justice, this would be more about shame. Shame being more when you break a societal stricture, guilt more when you break one of your internal strictures. And your uh, vocabulary would be one must, one must. One must do this, one must do that and you would be uh, involved in social justice. Please, I know that I'm making a little bit of a caricature. If you overactivate freedom, you get one constellation. If you underactivate freedom, you get another constellation. If you activate a proper amount of freedom, you get another constellation. And then I thought of another po uh, problem along the way, the problem of responsibility. And responsibility as I would define this, would be a much more social state. The ability to connect, the ability to respond to the exigencies of your immediate environment, your ability to respond. When we're developing hypnosis, one of the things that we developed in hypnosis that I showed you before is a change in response, where the person responds with more precision to the cues that are around them. So that was where I started my presentation. Then, as I moved along, I started to, to think about mm, freedom, defining freedom more as personal choice. 
I've started to think about personal responsibility as more of a moral choice. I started to think about social justice as being more of a social choice and responsibility being a choice of roles. Could we respond by moving into a different role? Because it's so strange that when the patient comes in, the patient takes that limited role, that what the therapist does is to respond by taking a rather limited role with a frame that what this experience is about is about introspection. Now clearly, when I was doing hypnosis with you, I was not asking you to introspect. When I was doing hypnosis with you, I was giving you an experience. I was asking you to change your state. Now I think that that's a distinctly different job that has not been given enough play in psychotherapy that psychotherapists can help people to change their state, not just to introspect about some facet of human existence. And hypnosis gives us an option that we don't have in other forms of therapy, change your state. Okay. So, enthusiastic. I thought, being given this nice opportunity by Paul Wong and the staff here to think, that we could uh, take this one step further and we could think about, um, oh, did I do that? Oh, this is the one. That what we could uh, extend this to the, to the idea of therapy that we could think about freedom being the personal choices that we make in therapy, personal responsibility, the moral choices that we make in therapy, justice, the social choices that we take in therapy, and responsibility, our choice of roles. And that we do not need to maintain a static role. And that in fact, in a paper that I recently did, I said that not only should therapists not exist, that hypnotists should not exist. And my point in making such an exaggerated claim was that if we limit ourselves to one role, the role of being a hypnotist, if we limit ourselves to the role of being a therapist, we miss some of the point in psychotherapy. And when we see people who are really excellent therapists, they seem to have a uh, an uncanny ability to be able to switch their role, to be response-able, and to take on a role that is uh, more adaptive in helping the patient to achieve what the patient's goals are. Now, I don't have time. <laughs> oh, dear. I didn't pre-space myself very well. Let's... Uh, let me, because uh, uh, what I was going to do is I was going to do a, a little activity with you, but maybe what I need to do is to just role play that activity for you. And the activity that I had in mind is that what if we started off with a dialogue and we said that in our dialogue, the dialogue had one rule. And the rule of the dialogue was yes, but. And so that was the only communication pattern that you could use. And the two participants in that dialogue could only do yes, but. So it would go like, I'm here. And then the other person would say, well, yes, but are you really here? And then the other person would say, well, yes, but is anybody ever really here? And the other person would say, well, yes, but um, does being here really matter? Uh, if that doesn't matter, what does? And if we just use that one rule of communicating, yes, but, what would we create? 
what would we would create is a kind of downward spiral. And just by using that one rule of yes, but, you could, within some small period of time, get yourself into the role of being a patient. <laughs> and just by using a linguistic rule, one thing that you did. Okay. So let's say that we switched, and because I was going to ask you to do that exercise, I just sorry that I don't have time to do that, because I think it's much better if you experience it. What if we switched and we changed the linguistic rule? We're only dealing with one small element of behavior. And by switching the linguistic rule, we switch to a pattern of, yeah, and. And we make the um, interaction work around that rule, one linguistic rule of yeah and. So person A says, I'm here. And person B says, oh yeah, and we can have a conversation. Oh yeah, and we can get to know each other. Oh yeah, and we can share some of the important things in our lives. Oh yeah, and we can learn some things that would be very useful to us and important to us. Yeah, and we can appreciate more of the immediate moment. Yeah, and we can really share some things that are very intelligent. We're really having a great time right now. That suddenly, if you just change the linguistic rule from yes, but, to yeah, and, you get an upward spiral rather than a downward spiral. And I would hope that you would recognize that if you were in the role, the accompanying role of that linguistic rule, yeah, and, the accompanying role would be, you wouldn't be a therapist. You would be a banker. <laughs> and you would be a banker in the sense that whatever you were given, whatever principle you were given, suddenly you were returning interest. And it would be a banker in the best sense of the word. Get principal, return interest. And if people would operate by that simple principle of doing yeah and communication rather than yes but communication, that one linguistic shift would shift a role. So then I thought, okay, well, let's go a little bit further with that and let's think even more robustly then my uh, previous uh, enterprise, my little, little uh, foray into making a, a kind of uh, graph that I started with about personal freedom and <coughs> personal responsibility and social justice and responsibility, and I started to chunk differently. And chunking is a a concept of making distinctions. Making useful distinctions is very interesting to me and I find that to be very valuable and it's a little bit of a lifelong pursuit. Let's see what interesting distinctions we can make. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you said to yourself, aha, I think that I will do freedom. How would you do freedom more robustly? What would be the phenomenology of freedom? Well, the phenomenology of freedom would be that your behavior would be kinetic. People who are free are, are, are being active, they're moving. You would, your perception, where is that P in perception? <laughs> your perception would be to look for opportunities. Because people who are free are looking for opportunities in which to express their freedom. That your affect would be an affect of, of feeling free. And your thinking would be, oh yeah, I can just. And then your attitude would be, yeah, great idea. And your physiology would be excitement. And your posture would be open. And your orientation would be hunger, I want experiences. And your grammar would be exclamation point, yes. Lots of exclamation points. And your time frame that you would be working in is now. And your vocabulary would be, well, seemed like a good idea, just do it, Nike. 
and your role would be Frank Sinatra. <laughs> My way. <laughs> And then if we thought about it, and if we wanted a patient, for example, to access a state of personal freedom, we know that by just making a little shift in vocabulary, yes, but, yeah, and, you could make a shift in phenomenology and a shift in the uh, direction of the spiral. And then if we're doing therapy and we want to uh, help somebody to access a state, one way in which you would, one first is, Think about it as if it were a state. If you think about it with, as if it's a state, if you examine it with a model of state, then you can divide it down into a sub-phenomenology, then you can help to build that sub-phenomenology by reintegrating some aspects of the state. What are the minimal systemic changes that you would need in order to access the state? You don't need to access all of these things. If you just access some of these things, that would change the state. Now, my hope was that if we did that little exercise, yes, but, that we would be thinking both vertically and horizontally. That horizontally, we could change the language and we could change the state. We could move from a pattern of yes, but, to a pattern of yeah, and, and change the state. But what would happen, for example, if we did the yeah, and dialogue, and we made what I would call a horizontal change. I'm sorry, a vertical change. And what we shifted when we were doing the game, yeah, yes, uh, yeah, and, what we shifted is that each of the participants would take on a new role. They would take on the role of personal freedom. And suddenly they would do the yeah and dialogue by making this vertical shift and changing their role. How would that change the dialogue? Interestingly, I think that you could uh, do the exercise, yeah, but make this uh, vertical leap shift your role and do a yes but dialogue from a role of personal freedom and see how would that change if you did it by virtue of making a shift in your role what if we decided that we didn't want to do personal freedom but what we wanted to do was uh, personal responsibility how could we do personal responsibility and then I had a, another series using the same template Um, what would be the, the uh, behavior that would go along with personal responsibility? This internal moralizing is how it was defining personal responsibility. Well, your behavior would be restrained. You would be looking inside, what must I do? You would either feel guilty if you didn't meet the, the constraint that you had, or you'd feel relief if you did meet the constraint. You would be thinking to yourself, I should. Your time frame that you'd be working within would be the present perfect, because you'd be wanting to make it perfect. And your role would be Rodin, because you would be inside yourself thinking about your uh, social, your uh, uh, personal responsibility. If we wanted to shift to the idea of uh, social justice, what would be the uh, kind of phenomenology that would go along with the state of social justice? Well, your behavior would be to be careful. You would be looking for what is proper. Your affect would be shame. Your thought would be what one must do. You would be external referencing. You would be looking for the rules that exist in the social system and you try to be behaving in conformity with the roles that exist or you would be imposing those roles that, that exist what will others think would be a vocabulary of thinking about social justice you need to behave you know according to some super ego dictate we don't have time to take that further but what if we took the role of responsibility as I'm defining responsibility to you, what would be some of the subcomponents of that state of responsibility? 
Well, your behavior would be flexible. Your perception would be a perception of being aware, looking for the responses. It would be about connection. I don't know why I didn't put the word connection there. It should have been the word that was connection. The thought would be, what can we do right now? What can we do right now? What can we do right now? Our attitude would be to utilize and uh, our orientation would be responsive and directed and our grammar in this state as I'm conceiving it to you as I'm developing that state would be an implied exclamation point. And I think that that's important because I once did a paper on the grammar of psychotherapy. When the patient is coming in and the patient is in their state, the state of being a patient, the, the uh, grammar of that patient is exclamation point, victim, exclamation point, help me. When the therapist is responding to that overt exclamation point with a grammar of, can you tell me about your past? Can you tell me about your feelings? And you're responding with a question mark to the patient's imperative you can immediately see that the patient's imperative is grammatically more powerful than the question mark that the therapist is supplying. And what Erickson was doing when he was doing metaphors and hypnosis is he was speaking to the patient in a series of implied imperatives. That's different. And I think it also matches the kind of grammar of the patient. So then I took one more leap in my uh, excursion here, which was to think about therapists as not being a person. That what therapist is, is it's a state. And the state of the therapist, we could use the same model to understand the state of the therapist. And we could understand the state of the therapist in a traditional manner. This is a tr traditional therapist. A state of a traditional therapist is being fixed, being aware, being empathic, how can I help, being understanding, being very relaxed, the posture being a little stiff and limited, the orientation of being available, the grammar of the question mark, the time frame usually, uh, in, at least in the psychodynamic model, examining the past, the vocabulary, how do you feel about it, and the role, take your pick. Right? It could be Carl Rogers, or it could be Albert Ellis, or it could be Beck, or it could be anybody who's asking people to introspect about some aspect of their experience. And it, it just so happens that there's many ways to uh, get to home. I'll stop in two seconds. <laughs> and it, you know, it's like that metaphor that uh, Gandhi said about different religions. You know, that we're all going to the same peak and that there's, many, that there's many different pathways. So therapists tend to pick one pathway if it is examining behavior or examining attitudes or examining transference or examining the past, introspecting as a route to change the person. But what I'm trying to offer you is the fact that we have different options as therapists. What happens to me, now that I've been studying hypnosis for 30 years, is that I am much more fluid, and that my role as being a therapist has changed. I did have one more handout, because the, in the other handout I extended this same idea to patient. What is patient? Patient is not a person, patient is a state. What is the state of the patient according to this sub-phenomenology? So, okay, so if we're going to be a therapist, then my admonition to you is that you have much more flexibility than you may be willing to uh, give yourself credit for or that you may be willing to recognize. And my admonition to you, or maybe more of an invitation, is that as you're doing therapy with your patient, if you haven't changed your role three or four times during the course of a the session, then uh, probably you've been unnecessarily limiting yourself. 
And that when you're seeing the patient and the patient is in, last thought, <laughs> and the patient comes in in this state of limitation, that you may want to take on for that patient a posture of liberty. And suddenly you may want to be talking about your psychoanalytic interpretations from a role of liberty. Or you may want to be talking to that same patient about the same idea, but you may want to shift your role. And you may want to shift into a role of uh, personal responsibility and deliver the message from a different state of personal responsibility. Or you may want to shift your role to a role of social justice. And you may want to take social justice and give the same kind of interpretation. Or you may want to take the role of responsibility and to give the same message from a different role. And I think that this should be part of our training. What an interesting exercise that I can offer you that you might do. You might you know, stand in front of a mirror and get an idea that you want to express to a patient. And instead of expressing that to the patient in one way, you shift your role and you take on a series of different roles in giving the same message to the patient. And you learn that by virtue of, and by virtue of being flexible, you will elicit more flexibility in your patient. You can shift roles. As I'm doing therapy now, I perambulate. I'm walking around the room. I'm taking on different postures when I'm doing hypnosis. I'm active. I'm kinetic. I'm taking on different roles. And I find that this changes my way of being a therapist. What interested me earlier in life was how do you do therapy? What are the rules? What are the things that you do? Now what I'm much more interested in is how can I be a therapist? And using this model is one of those ways in which I can accomplish that. So uh, I, uh, again, appreciate the opportunity for your kind attention. And, that's my message to you. So. Foundation has its brief therapy conference coming up in Orlando and I'm doing a program that's very interesting in Toronto at the end of August which I've never done in Canada before which is a five-day training program in hypnosis where I'm actually teaching people the mechanics of doing hypnosis so those of you who are on the East Coast and are interested I left some literature here about the Erickson Foundation publishing. I want to thank Jeff and uh and the Erickson Foundation for looking, up, looking after our C credits. I thank them for that. Okay. And uh, now, if you value the speech by Jeff or by Spinelli or by any other speaker, please order your tapes now so you can pick them up this evening. Otherwise, you have to pay for shipping. And also tonight, make sure to come out, come out to hear Harold Koenig. He's one of the leading authority on religion and his speciality in healing. questions and response, but we're pretty well out of time. And just to remind those of you who might have come in late, um, Alfred Langle has agreed to do an intensive training in existential and logotherapy the last week of February 2003. And those who are interested are encouraged to sign up at the desk just outside this door. And just a final reminder to those of you who haven't got an evaluation form in your packet or forgotten where it was or left your bag at home, uh, we do want to get the evaluations and there are some blank evaluation forms uh, in the boxes just outside the desk and we encourage you to do those. Thank you.